and I've been to San Francisco it's about the affordable housing crisis and we talk about homelessness in Seattle etc but I think what people don't know is that the crisis in affordable housing is existing right here in Burlington Vermont and in this state and in virtually every state in the country and that means that we have some 11 million families who are paying for housing, and when you do that, you don't have a lot left over necessities uh, of life. You're talking about people all across this country who were born and raised in a neighborhood who are being driven from those neighborhoods, losing the ability to maintain contact with folks that they grew up with and that they love. So there is a lot to discuss on the issue of affordable housing. There's one point. Uh, that I want to make before I give it over to the others. And uh, Mayor uh, Ada Kalu made this point. She's from Barcelona. Certainly this is an international perspective. And that is, I hope everybody here remembers, never forgets, that we are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. That we are a nation that spends $700 billion on the military more than the next 10 nations combined, that we just gave a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top 1%, and that when Wall Street crashed because of their greed and illegal behavior, somehow it just happened that not only the Congress came up with a huge bailout, but the Fed was there to provide zero interest loans to central banks all over the world. So if there is a crisis in affordable housing or in childcare or in any place else, the reason is not lack of resources, the reason is lack of political will. And the reason is a set of priorities determined by the wealthiest people in this country and large campaign contributors not working families. So that is kind of uh, the framework, I think, that we should go into this discussion with. Now, uh, I think you know the panelists. We have a great panel here. Let me begin uh, with a guy who's very intimidated by the cameras. Danny, I don't want you to, to get nervous by these cameras. Uh, Danny is, importantly, uh, not you know, just known all over the world as one of the outstanding actors uh, in our country. Danny is far more than that. He is for his entire life, his entire life, been active in a variety of progressive causes. Uh, and Danny, we are so happy to have you here as a fellow with the Sanders Institute uh, and also for your participation on this panel. Danny Glover. Thank you. Thank you. Let me give some sort of personal context to the, the whole idea of housing, affordable housing. Uh, I've lived in San Francisco my entire life, except for brief moments in New York doing theater. But certainly when, when I think about the, the ideas around uh, home ownership uh, and moving from, as I did, from federal housing projects as a young child into a home that my parents were able to buy because they were working workers in the post office and working class Job, jobs not only that, that afforded them the possibility of buying a home and, and raising a family in that home. And it's, an, it's a, something very psycho, incredibly psychological about that for a young child who comes and begins at, at one place in housing projects, moving their home, their own home. No matter how small that home was, it was our home in a sense. And we had proprietorship around that home. Something, something very in, incredible. I live in virtually the same neighborhood. I lived 12 blocks from where I grew up when my parents bought their first home. So there's some sort of context in which I look at the changes that have happened in that, that neighborhood. My first engagement with, in 1966, 
at 20 years old, was with the Western Virginia Community Organization, which was now fighting in a very tense struggle around, around preserving the traditional black community in the Fillmore District. And, and the, the heroic fight that homeowners put up because, because, of, because of eminent domain and the, and, the, and the redevelopment and everything else was something that I watched and, and, and was a part of, very much a part of it as early as, as, as 50 something years ago. So, so when the, from looking at it from this perspective and everything and watching my own neighborhood, when I moved on the block, when I bought my first home it, just before my 29th birthday in 1975. So I've been a homeowner in San Francisco since 1975. And the same home, the home that I live in now, is that home that I live in. So it, in some sense, watching the demographics of the neighborhood change as a result of that. Now, there are several perspectives from my vantage point when I think about that. My parents had opportunities that their children did not have, save that there were jobs available for them, the jobs allowed them to gain an income in order to buy home, et cetera, uh, home, et cetera, raise a family and this. Because on that same block that I moved on to, there were three people who knew my parents who worked at the post office. So I had immediate gratification. There were people that I was comfortable with. Them. All those things were possible. That has completely changed in, in the neighborhood that I live in. And, and, and part of that is, is about policy, and part of that is the market-driven, all the things we talk about. And the question, the question that I think is about, because the, pub, the, pro, the public sector or, or, or governance has a responsibility for those who are the most vulnerable, in the sense, San Francisco has changed, the changing dynamics of, 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 of what the city looks like now. It is no longer a working class city, and working class traditionally when we think about industrial worker, workers, home, uh, workers, public service workers like my parents, longshoremen, all those people were populated San Francisco, all that's changed. And what I see also happening in the fact that they're moved, out, not simply out of the center of the city, they've moved off the map of the political discourse that takes place as well. They moved out mm -hmm. there. And when you look at San Francisco now, issues in San Francisco have morphed into Oakland. As we see West Oakland with its proximity, its close proximity to downtown San Francisco, is now being gentrified, causing extreme issues in terms of homelessness, the homelessness that exists in San Francisco, and the homelessness that's put, uh, that, that is upon Oakland now because of what is happening. Now, the questions that we have will often lead to the market or the private sector. What are the questions that we have and what are the answers that we have that come out of the public sector? Good. Danny, thanks very much. Uh, obviously, this ga gathering that we're doing this weekend has an international perspective, and has a national perspective. Uh, but in this instance, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that has been done in this particular city. Uh, I've known Brenda Torpy for 35 years, yes. uh, from when I was mayor of this city, and Brenda is known in the state of Vermont as certainly one of the leading advocates uh, in the fight for affordable housing. So, Brenda, why don't you tell folks uh, what's been happening here in Vermont and in the city of Burlington? Thanks. Thank you, Bernie. And I want to thank uh, Jane and Dave and everybody who's been involved with this uh, gathering because it's been just tremendous. And also, I think, very important. As Bernie just said, we have a housing crisis in this country and nobody talks about it. And I really hope that today is the day that we come together in this progressive movement and change that and start giving to the people that we, we all are working with and understanding that they have a human right to housing they have an entitlement to decent housing, that housing is not something that's just for, for people to profit from, but in fact, something that we need to provide for all our residents and citizens. And I want to start with a little story about how this really needs to be done. And it starts you right here on Burlington's waterfront. And you know, it hasn't been the best weather to see how beautiful it can be. But I'm going to say, tell you about some things that I hope you'll see the beauty in this city that others would miss. And that is that you just go north of this building and there's 40 affordable apartments on this waterfront with those views next to million dollar condominiums. And then a mile up the road, still very close to downtown, beautiful location on the waterfront, 700 homes are going to be built over time in a very 
uh, green, sustainable development that will be a model, and 193 of those are going to be permanently affordable to people from very low income. We will move homeless people into apartments there, as well as through affordable home ownership. And where you're staying in your hotels, those of you visiting, if you just went a block north, we'd be in the old north end. Something that spurred us to start this effort, like Danny's story, a traditional working class neighborhood that was a site, suddenly a speculation. In that neighborhood, which is 0.8 of a square mile, there are 400 permanently affordable homes of all kinds in other communities. This is the legacy of a city where the mayor said that housing is too precious for our residents to leave it to the whims of the market and set about to create through policy and through our community land trust, which was the linchpin of this, combined uh, a, a policy overlay where this city could decommodify housing and, and create a stock of affordable housing that will serve our citizens in our city, not just today, but over time. And today, our, this community land trust called Champlain Housing Trust has over 3,000 homes serving the people of the region around Burlington, and these homes serve people from homelessness to affordable home ownership. And we're always growing, and we're always responding to changing needs. But this didn't happen because of us. This happened because of the partnership between a city that said, city government, I'm sorry, that said, engage with the citizens, give the citizens the tools and the resources and the opportunities to create this. So let's talk a little bit. And the reason I'm talking about this is not to tell everybody, said, don't just talk about us. But I'm telling this story because herein lie the seeds of the progressive housing policy that is now taking hold for the grassroots around the country in sort of a housing justice movement that is recognizing that we can no longer be fooled and by our government programs which feed this, that somehow the market is going to solve our housing problems. We as communities have to take hold of community-based, community-owned housing that can take many, many forms and serve a variety of, of local needs, but with partnership of government. And the one thing we need, uh, as Bernie said, we still have a housing crisis in Vermont. We are really just held back by the lack of affordable capital coming into this and investment into this. And if the federal government today spent on, on permanently affordable housing what they spent in the 70s on developers to develop housing that would be affordable for 10 years or 15, we would have the resources to meet this issue at scale. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other thing I'll say about when we started, you know, Bernie was this elected socialist mayor and people were getting used to that. But when he started talking about taking land out of the market, right? People were like, whoa, you can't do that. And there's a tremendous amount of pushback. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the only people who really still fight this are the developer interests, who know we are sitting on the most valuable land in Vermont. And we see housing as a value for our community. The value of housing for us is in its use as homes, in the use as providing dignity and a life and security to our citizens. And they see, right, how do you earn money? How do you extract profit? So we need to, to uh, move forward with an awareness of this. And what we're seeing around the country today is that other local governments, cities, I'm so glad we have mayors here, understand this. And because at the city level, we can't pass the buck about affordable housing. The homeless people are dying on our sidewalks and dying in our emergency rooms. And workers are being shunted around. And make no mistake, I'm sure many of you read Matthew De uh, Desmond's book, uh, Evicted. Getting evicted causes a deeper form of poverty. The housing insecurity that our workers live with is creating deeper forms of poverty. Mm -hmm. And so we need to address this in unity with these other movements we've been talking about in these last two days in order to make a difference. And I see the seeds of that nationally and internationally. I'll just mention a couple other things. Before I do, I want to say we have two luminaries of this movement in this room who could be talking now. One is John Davis, who we're lucky lives in Burlington, and the other is Gus Newport, uh, who's a... Uh, like, a, like, a, like a mayor of this community land trust movement. 
But around the country now, over 900 local jurisdictions are enacting the kinds of policies Burlington did, like inclusionary zoning and trust funds and land banking, the things, the resources that cities can build, either capturing value, like you do with inclusionary zoning, here we say 25% of any homes on our waterfront have to be affordable permanently, or also creating sources through trust funds, they have the power of taxation, and then the, the, the most successful model is working with nonprofits like Champlain Housing Trust because we can bring other and different resources to the table and also put more leadership and control of these community assets in the hands of people. And lastly, we're doing this also internationally. Champlain Housing Trust won the United Nations World Habitat Award, and that caused. <laughs> And there's a tremendous value in terms of spreading the model, which has always been our, part of our mission. And that the most expensive cities of the world, what are now called hedge cities, where people invest in housing just as a part of their portfolio and don't live there. Vancouver, London, Paris, Brussels. They are creating community land trusts, and many of them call it the Burlington model. It's interesting. But of course, but of course it's theirs and it's different. So our national network has now joined a, an international network called Cohabitat, which brings together all the forms of community-based housing. We don't have the only recipe, we don't have the only model. There's cooperatives, there's various forms of land banking. What unites us and what we're trying to bring the world's attention to as we, I am here uh, in this movement, that community-based and community-led housing created by and for people will continue to serve our communities and never be lost or taken by the market. And this is the only way our cities can plan for the future. And I'll make one last note about climate change. This is change. your third last point. Is it? I'm sorry. I'll make it your last, last okay. point. It's part of sustainable development. You can't plan your cities for sustainable development. And we talked about this uh, yesterday. If, as climate change forces more and more people and displaces them, we are seeing increased homelessness, and we need to address this issue. And we can't have our city say, oh, we're going to put affordable housing here for public transportation, and then let it go to the market 10 years later. We need to build in our sustainability, which includes the sustainability of our people being able to live in our cities. And I'll leave it there. Brenda, thank you. Sorry, Michael. I want to add to the luminaries who were involved in the land trust program. I don't know if Terry Baricius is here, uh, but Terry was on the city council way back in the early 1980s. Terry. Fought vigorously for that idea. Uh, and I will also say, I will also say as somebody who never goes through picket lines, I did walk through a picket line in front of City Hall <laughs> where the real estate people were there on the night that we voted for the land trust. <laughs> Um, our next uh, panelist is Michael Weinstein. Uh, Michael is, among other things, uh, the president and co-founder of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And I do want to uh, make mention uh, that today is World's AIDS Day, and let us never forget that some 35 million people worldwide have died of HIV or AIDS since the early 1980s. And Michael has been very active on that issue. Uh, Michael uh, has also been very active in the fight to lower the cost of prescription drugs. And I want to just make an aside here. I was out in California working with Michael and his group in 2016, and they had a rather modest idea that the state of California should not pay more for prescription drugs than the Veterans Administration does. Not a radical idea, a sensible, modest idea. And we went out there and we worked together. The pharmaceutical industry to defeat one ballot item in one state spent $120 million. Never forgot that. All right? And that is why we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. No Republicans supported that initiative. And in one of the most democratic states in the country, I have to say, there were very few Democrats who supported that. But because of Michael's work and the work of other people, we got 47% of the votes. Mm. All right, but Michael is here today uh, as the president and founder of the Healthy uh, Housing uh, Foundation. Mike, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. 
I feel like I'm here among family. It's just so great to be here today. Uh, thank uh, Jane Sanders for convening this fantastic meeting. I want to explain a little bit how I came to this issue. Um, about 5% of our patients in Los Angeles are now homeless. Our employees travel insane distances to get to work. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse. I travel across the globe. Our organization, the largest AIDS organization in the world, we're in 42 countries. I have never seen more homelessness than in the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. City of Los Angeles is the homeless capital of the world. I've been to places where there are shanty towns with a million people. I've been to places where people share, there are multiple families share one home, but I've never seen a place anywhere I've traveled in the entire world where we have 53,000 people putting their head on the sidewalk every single night. That is scandalous. That is shameful. So to the point that you made, we cannot treat shelter as a commodity. You know, we focus a lot as progressives on health care. Mm -hmm. But for most people, having a roof over your head is more immediate and more critical, even than health care itself. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very, very important to understand that the number one economic justice issue, economic inequality issue in American cities, and those are small ones and large ones, is housing, yes. is shelter. Yes, absolutely. I, mean, I like Bernie, uh, grew up as a New York City renter. Hmm. And, you know, my father drove a truck. And we had a decent way of life. We had a clean, decent place to live. And that was never in question. In, in Los Angeles, where we've been increasing the minimum wage, for families who afford the average apartment, they have to work 92 hours a week. Okay. Um, huge swaths of people are paying, as Bernie said, more than half of their income. People are choosing between food and shelter. It's scandalous. And it didn't happen by accident. Let's be clear about that. And again, um, I've got to be as critical of our Democratic friends as our Republicans, because mm -hmm. the Democrats mm -hmm. are the ones in, who run the biggest cities in this country. Mm -hmm. And they have been involved in multi-billion dollar giveaways to the real estate interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles, routinely, you can buy a piece of property, let's say where you're allowed under the law to build 10,000 square feet. And you can make a political contribution to a Democratic city council person and our mayor, okay? And they will grant you by the, you know, the, by the, with the signature, the ability to build something 10 times that large. Mm -hmm. And all of it is luxury. Okay. They give us, you know, the gift, the crumbs that they give us frequently is 5% inclusionary low-income housing. But even though, you know, that sounds like the worst of it, it isn't. Because when you plunk a luxury building into a working class area, Amen. everything around it becomes gentrified. This, and it's frustrating for me to hear Democratic Party politicians subscribing to trickle down. Okay. In this theory, we will build a luxury tower that's $5,000 per apartment. And over time, it'll come down and people, working people, will be able to afford it. Um, I don't know what neighborhoods they're talking about, but every luxury uh, condo that I've ever seen remains a luxury condo. So uh, I think it's really important that we um, 
put pressure as we have on healthcare. I mean, now everyone's jumping on board with Medicare for all, right? Okay. We need to put pressure on. We put an initiative on the ballot uh, this November to repeal a law called the Costa Hawkins Law. And this law exists in 47 states. What happened in the 70s and 80s was that the state legislatures, under the domination of real estate interests, decided to take the power away from localities and give it to the state. That's, that it said, you cannot extend rent control past 1995 anywhere in California. And if you already have a rent control law in place, it's frozen. So in Los Angeles and San Francisco, it's frozen at 1978 and 1979. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So, of course, like the drug companies, they poured you know, tens of millions of dollars, $80 million uh, into this campaign. And we got 40% of the vote. We won in San Francisco, we won in Los Angeles, we won in Berkeley, in Oakland, in Santa Monica, in West Hollywood. Um, but we couldn't touch them in the money when it came to TV and otherwise. And we didn't, we got a long list of endorsements, including a lot of electeds. But prior to that, we tried to get it through the legislature, and we couldn't get it out of the first committee in the democratically controlled legislature in California. And all this bill did was restore the right of local government to control uh, those uh, decisions. So we have a lot of work to do. I'll just end by saying, um, in this campaign, first of all, um, I wish that the unions, we, the nurses were fabulous, the teachers were fabulous, but we didn't have enough money. And when I sat down with them, I said, are all the gains that you've gotten for your members in the last 10 years equal to what they've lost in housing? Mm -hmm. and they said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Nothing we've gotten for them Mm -hmm. compares to what they've lost. Okay. Um, and uh, so the last thing I want to say, this is my last last, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. is that, you get three. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so our idea at AIDS Healthcare Foundation has always been not just to, um, to tell them, but to show them. That's right. Okay. So what we did was we've bought four single room occupancy hotels. Most of those rooms were empty because the real estate speculators were holding on to them, mm -hmm. right? We bought them and we've taken people and put them from the sidewalk into a decent, respectful place to live. On the other hand, the city program, and this costs an average, by the way, of $70,000 per unit. Nothing fancy, but decent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the city program which is part of the whole affordable uh, housing industrial complex, complex. is spending $500,000 per unit mm -hmm. to house one person. Oh. Okay, that is not sustainable. So I hope that you know, from you know, this uh, gathering and others, we will push housing to the top of the agenda Amen. and that we'll employ the creative ideas uh, that we have in order to uh, begin to make a difference in something that's so vital to people's lives. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I want to have a little discussion with the panelists, and then we'll open it up to some questions. When Danny was talking, I was thinking, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn in a family that did not have any money. Uh, we lived in a three and a half room rent controlled apartment. And what I was thinking about, actually, Danny, made me think about it, is that it was an incredibly stable community. Right? Everybody was in the same boat. Rents, I don't know how much my parents, I think it was $75 a month uh, at that point. But my father never made much money. And people stayed there. We got to know the schools were good schools. And uh, you know, we all grew up uh, together. And that kind of stability is something that I think is lacking uh, in many communities uh, all over this country. The other point that Michael made, and sometimes I forget about it, you know, we are fighting to raise the minimum wage, $15 an hour, that's good. But if housing costs are soaring, that $15 ain't gonna buy you a whole lot of housing. Right. Right? And, and we've got to uh, recognize uh, that. 
Uh, so let me, uh, I, I want to do two things. Um, um, throw back to Danny here um, to take it anywhere he wants. Uh, but uh, I, I want to talk about some real solutions uh, that are taking place uh, in our country and around the world. And Brenda, maybe you can get uh, a little bit more into what a land trust really means. Because okay. I don't know that everybody knows okay. that. Uh, and Danny, you know, you've been around. What would you like to, to see happen? Let me, let me talk about, because <clears throat> we talk about this, and we can't talk about this within a vacuum in some sense. Uh, certainly, the historic issues around housing in major, uh, his, in major cities, you know, is important to understand. How black people did not move to Harlem until, until 1900, after 1900, and the great migration that happened at that time, and, and because of the glut, the overbuilding of housing in New York, allowed them to move from Hell's Kitchen and, 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 and certainly up to, up, to, up to Harlem. So understand that there's certain historic dynamics that cause people to move. Incredibly, within 20-something years, you have this extraordinary cultural boom called the Harlem Renaissance in New York. The same thing happens in San Francisco as well. And, and understanding the nature of housing and the racial overtones historically and how they play out mm -hmm. today as well. The Mission District, which I've worked in the Mission District. I worked for the Model Cities Program and the Office of Community Development for six and a half years in the early 70s. So the Mission District and the Baby Hunters Point, which are tradi one's traditionally Hispanic, the other traditionally African American, settled primarily because it's on the outskirts of San Francisco, settled, settled doing before and during World War II as men and women came to find work in the war industry in the shipyards and everything else and settled in that area. Those places have been gentrified as well, and right now. When I've worked out there, one of the programs that we, we had there was one specifically the housing, which I was in charge of. I was the program manager and evaluation specialist for that, that program in 1974, 1975. The, uh, the other point I wanted to make as well, because the depopulation of San Francisco is real, of African Americans. In one article I saw some time ago in the New York Times, it said that you can take every African-American living in San Francisco, Cisco, put them in Pac Bell Park, that's the baseball park that the Giants play in, and you won't fill the park up. It's $45,000. And most of those people you place in there live on some sort of housing, with some sort of housing assistance program as well. So in, in the sense that I, I'm not thinking, I'm thinking that all this is not reversible. I know there was a proposition a few years ago, Proposition C, which was to stop and put a moratorium on housing in the Mission District. I worked in the Mission District in a very vibrant time in the 70s and 80s where you had migrants coming in and people coming in and all those dynamics coming in. So we cannot overlook the racial dynamics historically and now and the impact that it has on housing, whether it's in Harlem now or whether it's other places as well. And as I see people that I know move for further outside of the, the framework of any kind of political discourse within what happens in the city, I'm concerned about they travel in the day. If you're traveling an hour or so to work and traveling an, more than an hour or so back home, you don't have too much to time to engage in anything at all, mm -hmm. except getting home and getting prayer prepared to come the next day. So these are real issues. How we, how we deal with these issues are very, going, going to be complex in a lot of ways. Certainly, we, as I said before, the public space that we as citizens have to have a voice, even those who live within the city and who feel comfortable and comfortable in their neighborhood, we have to have some sort of say in that process. And, and, and that, is, that is one of our responsibilities. As we say, it, and, and every, everyone has said here, that, that the critical, and that critical situation in housing is real. It is real, it, is, it finds itself, manifests itself in Oakland, California. Oakland, California used to be a population of 44% African Americans. And, 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 and those places, those industrial places, uh, right on the edge of Oakland as you cross the, from San Francisco to uh, the Bay Bridge into Oakland, those are being gentrified. P people are being moved out, p people are buy, uh, buyers 
buildings, moving out those people who pay rent and subsidize rents and low rents and everything else, and you find this incredible homeless situation as you find in L.A., as you find in San Francisco. We can't hide that. No matter how many skyscrapers we build, no matter how we Manhattanize, Manhattanize downtown San Francisco, you can't hide that. Okay, um, Brenda, you talked about the uh, Community Land Trust. Why don't you explain to people what it is mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what, where it is moving internationally, as a matter of sure. fact. Sure, thanks, Rudy. So the, the community land trust model does two things. It's, it's about uh, it's democratic ownership and stewardship of land, which you do through the organization. We're a membership nonprofit, so all land you buy is a collective responsibility. And then we can sell homes. The, the key to the land trust model is most nonprofits, you know, you buy housing, you rent it out. You know, you can do that. But how do you give people home ownership and keep it affordable? This was the innovation that captures people's imagination mostly about the community land trust. But I believe uh, it's the whole package. But to buy a home with us, we put the investment that makes it affordable to a buyer. We serve low-income home, home buyers, and we leave it in the property. So then the homeowner has a much lower mortgage. It's, it's based on, on income affordability. Lower mortgage, they start building equity right away in that mortgage, you know, puts people in a different financial place, and it's theirs and their children can inherit it. But should they decide to sell, we will recycle that subsidy for the next buyer. So we have like 610 homes right now. They've served over 1,100 families because people move in our culture, people move and move on. Now, we found that in our market, uh, at the last time we studied, which has been a while, almost two-thirds actually go on to buy in the market. So we've actually created both ho secure home ownership for people who'd never otherwise leave renting, but also a, a new stepping stone in that tenure ladder for people who are trying. And that's been a, a tremendous thing. But I want to just, one thing Bernie said that I think is really important and we see every day 2,200 of our homes are rentals of different kinds, but a lot of them are just bread and butter rentals affordable to workers. And once people can settle down in a rental, as you described, where they know they can stay and they have security and they get to know their neighbors and they can be proud of living there, many of the benefits people ascribe to home ownership renters can have. It's about giving people that security of tenure. And our model does that. The other part, the democratic stewardship, is really important to people because you know, we're buy if you say you're going to buy up a lot of land for your community, you should be transparent and open and include your community in that. So our board of directors always includes residents, rep a third, representatives of local government, and general members. We own, uh, under our stewardship, our homes are valued at almost $300 million now because there's so much property. So it gives you a sense of this responsibility of community assets that we're stewarding for the community. And I think that the democratic ownership is important, and it is for one more reason. We talked about this yesterday. Government, we want to change government, and we need to change government and support that and be active politically. Um, but we need to also build that culture and those institutions outside of government because governments change. Sometimes we'll lose. Another mayor could have come in and destroyed all the policies, and people have tried, that we put in place here. And then the people who have the benefits who are in these communities, that is your leadership to support. And we've sustained the gains we made because we have empowered our residents in this way. So internationally, people, I would say the first adopters were really these expensive cities where, um, you know, in England and in, in like in Vancouver and Canada, um, the government has done a lot of social uh, housing and rental. But what captured people's imagination in these hot markets is that, that you could really give people an ownership and still have that community support and have it in community hands and keep it affordable. But in, um, in, in the global south, in communities that are living in informal communities and, you know, they invest everything in their little homes and have no security, if they could collectively buy the land, you know, it's a power they could never have individually. Uh, to fight uh, the pressures sometimes of governments or developers coming in. And so it's a model that offers a tremendous amount of uh, a flexibility to local need. We have co-ops on ours, we have rentals, we have special needs housing, we have shelter, we have parks, we have 
community facilities and community centers and things like that. So in other places, they're doing urban agriculture and community land, just whatever your community needs. But that place will be in the hands of your people. And that's what's really important. You know, realtors, what I love about the land trust is it, it addresses this core issue of who has access. People treat housing like it's an affordability and income issue. Oh, the wages aren't high and all those things are true, but it's actually a power and access issue. It's a wealth issue. Who gets the land? Who gets it? And once in our cities, once we give up our land to that private development, we don't control how, how expensive it'll get or what else will be done with it. And so these models that say, we're going to secure some of our community for our community. There's community value we've created. There's a value of housing for our people in, and this is a way to do it. So that's the model. Thanks. Thanks. Michael, you have been all over this country, and in fact, all over the world looking at this issue. What should we do? Well, first of all, I think the whole idea of innovation is extremely important. Adaptive reuse should be at the top of the list. There's tons of empty buildings, industrial buildings, of former, you know, a lot of hospitals have closed. Many such buildings have, have, uh, are not in use, and they could be rehabbed. That's good for the environment rather than tearing mm -hmm. down and building up, okay? And it can be done cheaper and faster, but many different kinds of, you know, our nation is filled with backyards. Hmm. What about putting uh, what they call, in California, we call them granny units. Why not putting small micro houses in those empty spaces? Um, secondly is, we've got to cut out the speculation. We've got we to gotta crack yeah. down on Airbnb. Uh, that's taking yes. away a lot of housing stock. Um, we've got speculative building uh, where people uh, have empty units that they're stockpiling. We should tax them like Vancouver yes. did. Any empty units in a luxury building should be taxable. Um, we need to uh, uh, secure the housing for Americans and immigrant people who live here, not people who are, you know, moving their money from, you know, one or another despotic country, and they're, they're banking it, okay? And, and, and they'll use it, if you're lucky, they'll use it once a year, and maybe they'll own five of these condos. That has to stop. Um, Another thing is we've got to get the dirty money out of the politics at the local level. A, a city council person should not be able to take a contribution from a developer today and vote on their project tomorrow. So, and, um, and, and I'll say this. When we're talking about inclusionary zoning f in luxury buildings, we shouldn't settle for 5%. It should be a third. Okay. And that sounds radical, but it's doable. And the last thing I'll say is, all of this is, is very, very important. But you know, you talk about New York City, the amount of investment in government housing that was done you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s had provided homes for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. So government investment at the federal, state, and local level is also extremely important. Good. Thank you. Okay. Let's open it up uh, to questions. I see a hand right there, ma'am. Yeah. Um, so I actually ran for my county commission. You endorsed me, so thank you for that. Hey, yeah. Did you um, win? Unfortunately, no. Right. But Next uh, time. <laughs> we didn't win that election, but we did win a lot of hearts and minds because we didn't just talk about this. We screamed about it. Um, this, I live in a county. Well, I, I come from Florida, and it's the land of second and third homes. And while those people are there for season, um, the people that clean the pools and mow the lawns are there year round. And that's a huge problem. So I didn't take a single dollar from the developers. And that was what made the difference for a lot of the Republican crossover that we saw. But I want you guys, if you could, um, speak a little bit about the future of what this housing crisis looks like, uh, given the context of sea level rise. Right? Florida is not going to be there for much longer, and, and a lot of people in this country live on waterways and coastal areas. What, what is this going to look like in 10, 15, 30 years? I have a very specific Florida example. Mm -hmm. We are attempting to build 680 micro units in downtown Fort Lauderdale right now, and you would think that we were trying to overthrow the entire government. Okay. <laughs> it is so ugly and raucous. The opposition, okay, this is, is in a non-residential area, south of downtown Fort Lauderdale. 
So we have to organize at the local level, for sure. OK. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Bruce Marks, and um, I'm the CEO of NACA. So there is an answer. There is a solution to this. We are providing no down payment mortgages, no closing cost mortgages, and at a below market fixed rate. We have $15 billion that we're, that we're doing this. We're doing Achieve the Dream events around this country. Today, as we speak in Philadelphia, we have over 2,000 people coming through getting this one mortgage. So what my question is, what built the suburbs, the white suburbs after World War II was the no down payment mortgage because of the white suburbs, because if you were a minority, you couldn't get that mortgage. The policy should be, we should have VA mortgage for everybody because people work hard and that you shouldn't have to have a down payment. And our performance on over billion dollars, billions of dollars of mortgages is the best performance in the country, a foreclosure rate of 0 0.0021. It's a model that works on scale, and we should make that the national policy. Bernie, it'd be great for you to be out there, no down payment mortgages for working people across the board. And one last thing, purchase rehab. If you're gonna get those properties, we're one of the only companies in the country that is doing, that says you can have money set aside after the closing to renovate those houses. So there is affordable housing out there, but the only people that can get it are the investors because working people can't get access to money to renovate their homes. Thank you. So, so I love the scale of what you do, and I want to repeat, and I think you've heard this on the panel, we can't, none of the models we're talking about will work unless the federal government comes back and invests at scale that we need. I will, but I do want to consider uh, in your model uh, that a lot of the housing that was provided through VA mortgages and RD mortgages and subsidized down payments and so on in this country were affordable when we did it and those folks had an affordability and now those are very expensive homes. So we have to think about how much of that stock we want to keep affordable in our communities as long as the people living in them are going to earn enough with their mortgage to have a good life. And I think that's the balance we have to strike in the future if we're going to continue to serve people in time at scale. Otherwise, every time you do it, you're done. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name's Heidi Harmon. I'm the mayor of San Luis Obispo. It's the fifth least affordable place to live in the United States. <laughs> Um, I'm not saying that as a point of pride. Um, and we've done a lot on housing since I was elected two years ago after I came back from the convention for you, Bernie. Um, and there's been a huge generational divide created between the older incumbent residents, sometimes called NIMBYs, and the generally younger folks that are fighting for a place to live in our community. And the older incumbent residents seem to be coming from a real place of fear. Mm -hmm. They're seeing this as a loss for them. Mm -hmm. And so what messaging or story have you been able to create to help them not come from that place of fear, but instead see the benefits and the moral call too to create more housing. And so we can get to yes. Go with into them. a little bit, what is the fear? What is the fear that people are perceiving? They got, well, it's, it's fear, but it's also elitism, right? I mean, they got there first. I don't know if you've been to San Luis Obispo, but it is a really beautiful, special place, like probably a lot of you come from. And there's a real drawbridge sort of philosophy, right? We got here first. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody wants the drawbridge to come up behind them. Um, and this is why it's so expensive to live there. Um, and I think there's also, an, it seems again, intergenerational. There's a, an older generation that tells the story of we worked hard to get what we get. And so we got what we got and you're not doing that. And they don't understand the economic context, the difference in that generation and the people that are coming up behind them, that we just haven't had almost any of those opportunities that people in the older generation have. I've got it. Tough luck for you. I want right, to say Michael? a couple of things. First of all, I went to Cal Poly briefly. I know how beautiful San, San Luis Obispo is. Uh, but uh, in the campaign on Prop 10, they sent out mailers to every voter saying how much money uh, they would lose on their property values if they voted yes. Okay, and, and I think it's a very, it's a very, very important thing to focus on. A home is the biggest investment for most people, and the most equity they have in life is that home. 
So they're, they're very uh, zealously guarding that. So I think we do have to address the issue. Uh, but the converse is, if we have 53,000 homeless people in Los Angeles now, what happens when it's 500,000? What, what are the property values going to be like? What's the quality of life going to be like? Do we really want to live in a place where it's survival of the fittest? Well, OK. Um, yes, ma'am. I just wanted to sort of anchor this discussion in a historical context. And so I appreciate what you said about NACA. Hold that mic close to your mouth, please. Hold it closer. OK. I appreciate what you said in no payment, no down payment mortgages. But many people don't understand that the suburbanization of America, the segregation, the racial yes. segregation of America, yeah, yeah, right. was federal policy. Yes. And so what we see, I'm thinking about your comment, when people said, well, we got here first, they were given this opportunity. And the opportunity, the federal laws, the banking laws of 1938, said that no mortgage would be given such that you would change the racial or social homogeneity of the community. So it's policy that has created the situation. And what you see as an outgrowth of this policy is redlining. I'm from New York. I grew up in the Bronx, you Brooklyn. I could not have rented a home in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? So I think that this issue has to be addressed and America has to understand that what, what we have here, the horror, I mean the horror, what we have in terms of the segregation of this society, the racial housing segregation, school issues, the segregation in schools is really related, goes back to this problem, that it is part of New Deal policy. And so if the policy was put in place, it has to be undone. Yes. Richard Rothstein wrote The Color of Law, Color of Law. and everybody should take a yes. look at that, Read that. that book. Mm -hmm. you know, just, just a point. When, when I spoke about my parents buying their first home, it was because of white flight into the suburbs and the, the benefits that had, were afforded. My dad, my father was a veteran, so he was able to get along. Like I said, he had a job as long as my mother and both of them were working, working, working class, working family and everything else. So I, I, tried, to, I tried to say so much of what we see, so much we see now has its, for, its, its, its much larger historic implications. When the African-American community expanded in places like New York, I mean, excuse me, like, like Los Angeles and San Francisco, in the, 19, in the early 40s is because of what? The internment of Japanese. And African Americans moved into, mm -hmm. moved into those places there right now. In persons in the film world, African American community has always been adjacent to the, to the Japanese community in San Francisco in that, in that sense. So most of those things. The question is, what are the kind of cultural productions that we do around this in a sense? I, I did a movie with, with with a, a group of young uh, filmmakers just uh, this past year, this year, who were talking about the last black man in San Francisco. And it basically was talking about gentrification, it was talking about, and also the fact, the little known fact of the uh, migration of African Americans and expansion of the black community was a result of the internment of Japanese at World War II. So all these other implications that happened, what's happening in the Mission District and everything else. Mission District traditionally that the first, the oldest mission in it's, it's Mission Dolores in San Francisco, and that was from the, that was built in the 15th in the 16th century. So all these kind of dynamics are still alive and now. Cities are where people live. We can't get in the 21st century beyond and say how are we going to live together is the question that we have, and how it's going to be equitable is the question that we're going to have as yes, well. Okay. And that's the main, that's the main, great critical issue. So I think it's important for us to understand that we talked about the segregation of school. When I went to San Francisco, when I was going to school in San Francisco, it was the top five school, this uh, uh, school system in the country. Now it's at the bottom five. All those are the kind of things that we see uh, that, that are happening as well. There's a question over there. It's been up for a long time. Right. 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 John. Okay, the exercise. Yeah, John. In, in Chicago, where where I live, and some of the uh, faith workers I work with, um, and I think going on what Danny was saying, uh, 
uh, Father Michael Flager in Chicago, yeah. who I know Bernie Sanders spoke with at the MLK. His community, which is 20 minutes from Chicago, doesn't have any investment. There's no investment in anything. There's no public schools. There's no housing. There's nothing except for what you know some of the activists have done. So how can we get in these areas where, as I go 20 minutes from Chicago to work with that community, the stores that are there have triple thick bulletproof glass. Mm -hmm. And that's how people are living. And there's 20, 2,500 people shot uh, this year alone. How can we get any investment in areas like that that are so desperately needing it, so desperately needing what you, you, you're offering, the most blighted communities? So I was wondering how that's um, transferable to different cities like Chicago. Okay. So why are the banks to loan there? The, well, no, the banks won't loan to anybody. But even with, and with bank financing, you need equity which only the government can provide. So I would say this is the other side of the coin of gentrification and the financialization of all housing markets. That it, when there's disinvestment, you can't get capital there. And our government programs follow that. But the, and the only reason anybody will come and invest in your neighborhood is if it's got gentrification potential and they're speculating. So we need to have housing programs that are based on need and based on where people live and based on where communities want to provide and secure their housing and preserve housing for their people instead of programs that follow these market principles which are completely contrary to the purpose of housing. In housing, housing was always commodified, but in the 80s, it really got financialized with the, those instruments. And what the financial crash really showed was what, what a sort of a, what a pyramid scheme the market is. And if our, our government programs follow that, they're going to waste money or make it worse. And it, the thing about the financial crisis is that it was a huge transfer of wealth from our affordable low-income neighborhoods back to Wall Street. And the biggest landlord after it is BlackRock, a venture capital fund. So that's the way funding of housing was done. And now we need to have programs that reconnect the purpose of our public capital at least to the purpose of housing. And that's what we need. And, and there's, a, there's a program, John, there's a program in Chicago called the Sweetwater Foundation. An extraordinary program, a young, a young activist is building community, not only building community, but it's, it's really uh, approaching uh, dealing something uh, with, with the, on the south side of San, uh, Chicago. Sweetwater found Emmanuel Pratt, Sweetwater Pratt. I was hoping he would be here to, uh, to talk about his project as well. Okay, Erhard. Thanks. Uh, Erhard Monica, I've been here in Burlington a long time, full housing advocate. And first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to Bernie because uh, it's been a lot of thanks to Bernie over uh, the course of the last couple of days, but uh, one in particular. Um, Bernie was the lead sponsor of a uh, bill that turned out to be uh, the first new federal housing program in uh, decades, yep. the National Housing Trust Fund, which many of us fought for. And thank you for that, Bernie. I really yeah. appreciate it. By the way, the other co-sponsor, that was Barbara Lee of California. Barbara and I worked together. So, my, my question has to do with the mortgage interest deduction. So, folks... Uh, who are homeowners may have at some point deducted their mortgage interest from uh, their tax return if they can itemize. But most people can't itemize. And it is the single largest housing subsidy that the federal government provides. It's over $100 billion a year. It's more than twice the HUD budget. If we're talking about lack of resources and misdirection of resources, one of the most misdirected resources is the ability to deduct mortgage interest uh, on, your, on your taxes. It benefits the wealthiest property owners in the country. It is completely misdirected. If we could redirect that to programs like the National Housing Trust Fund, uh, we would make great headway in all of our communities uh, in terms of providing affordable housing uh, to low and moderate income folks, working people, and to the homeless. Could you please talk about that a little bit? Well, I mean, I'll just say, be uh, very uh, honest here, I think that uh, politically would be a, a very, very tough sell. I mean, I think that um, there are enough, there are millions of people, even in the middle class, who get a benefit from that. Uh, you don't have to be super wealthy in order to get a benefit from the mm. mortgage interest deduction, in my opinion. Yeah. No. Well, I'm not saying it doesn't disproportionately benefit, it although is. it's capped now at 10,000. So it, it actually, uh, in these high uh, real estate value and, and tax states like uh, California, New Jersey, yeah. and New York, actually, uh, there is 
uh, a limit on it, and many people pay more than that. So I, I'm not sure about it politically. Yeah. So Michael and others, I encourage you to look at, there's a tremendous proposal by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which has in fact garnered a lot of broad support. The only people who will oppose this really are realtors. That, the realtor, they're strong, powerful lobby again, but that's us saying, you know, because they fund it, we can't win. But in this issue, if we were to cap their proposal, you cap it, you make it a tax credit for people who buy. This doesn't even help people to become homeowners. It's something you get after you're already in the upper middle class or the middle class. So, but if we did that, you would have enough money to provide a, an entitlement to rent subsidy to everybody under 30% median. And one of the crimes in this country of having no entitlement to housing whatsoever, regardless of your condition, you could be on SSI, disabled, elderly, we should have rent subsidy for those folks where they are, home, and this is why we see so many older sick people homeless. And that is a perfect transfer of where we're putting our money. It's just one small thing and one example. But the question but is, 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 it's a, well, is, is, is yeah. the core issue controlling the amount of money that people can charge, or is the core issue the, um, uh, yeah. the, the lack of, of production of, of, of housing? I mean, I think that we have to deal with the emergency that's at hand right now. The emergency that's at hand right now Rent is subsidy. speculation and, and unbridled greed. Yes, I think that's the most important thing to do right now is to put a limit on that. Uh, okay. Go with that. Um, let me get, oh, I'm going to hear too much. Yeah, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Varun. Um, I just, I, you guys are the specialist, and I'm in New York right now, and Mr. de Blasio, uh, who I met, he's a wonderful person, um, he's been in the middle of the Amazon thing, and you guys are the specialist, and also Nomigi Khan's, She's running for public advocate, and she's been violently uh, against it. So my question to you guys is, um, so the argument that's being made is that the 1.5 billion uh, of tax subsidy that we've get, given Amazon is somehow going to long-term benefit us, and then there's other people that are saying that that money could be used more productively. So this question is for both of you. Do you think this is a beneficial thing? Do you think Amazon should be allowed to come in and make cities fight each other, which is some dilemma that we have to deal with on a local level. Um, that's let, my me question. Take, let me take yeah, the first yeah. crack at that. Yeah. <laughs> As somebody who has dealt with Amazon. Uh, Amazon... <laughs> what you got, and I speak as a former mayor as well. All right? Every mayor in this country wants decent paying jobs for his or her constituents. Uh, but what you have are companies like Amazon, which are incredibly wealthy, incredibly powerful, uh, and in an outrageous way. And let's be clear about it. What Amazon says to every city in America, every state in America, nothing new. Nissan said the same thing. You want good automobile jobs? We got thousands of jobs for your community, says Nissan, to Mississippi and Tennessee and Alabama, non-union states. All right, what are you going to give us? I got thousands of jobs here. How many tax breaks are you going to give me? All right? You're going to train your workers, you're going to rebuild the infrastructure. So you got communities all over this country that are being blackmailed. You know, mayors want to do the right thing. But all over this city, all over this country, you got communities that are being blackmailed by a handful of multinational corporations. Now there are ideas that are out there to level this playing field and to say to Amazon and everybody else, you cannot play one community off against the other. And that for every tax break you get, we're going to raise your federal taxes, for example. To do away with that incentive. Right? So large corporations are going to go where they're going to go for a thousand different reasons. All right? New York is a great city. You know, San Francisco, whatever it may be. Burlington, Vermont. But it should not be this horrific situation where we ask middle class taxpayers to have to subsidize, in this case, the wealthiest person in the world. So this is a national issue that I think we've got to address. All right, I think we have maybe uh, one or two more questions back there. Uh, what do we got? Yes, ma'am, right here. Yes, ma'am, right here. Yeah. Hi. Hi. 
Um, I'm Tanya. I've worked here in Burlington um, with some of the most vulnerable individuals experiencing homelessness. And when we talk about programs like the land trust programs, they're wonderful programs. And many times these are individuals who cannot jump through the hoops to access them. So when we talk about access, are we truly talking about access for everyone? Or are we lowering the bar and utilizing methods like housing first? to mm -hmm. end homelessness. Mm -hmm. if, people, if you want to end homelessness, you give people homes. And so what are we doing to ensure that the, the most vulnerable, the people who cannot go to classes and cannot necessarily stay sober, have a place yes. to live to do that work? Thank you. All right, before That's I give it over to others, I mean, let's yeah. put the blame, and Michael made this point, the responsibility where it should lie, and that is at the federal government level. Yeah. All right, it is hard to ask cities, whether it's New York City or Burlington, if they don't have the resources to do what has to be done. So this speaks to changing our national priorities instead of tax breaks for billionaires, investing in a variety of affordable housing concepts. Yeah. Uh, but, one, but one hopeful note uh, locally is that uh, I hear you and in the uh, more recent, this is the value of creating community social assets. Recently we were asked by people like you our providers to serve more people that are coming out of homelessness. So we've invested money that we have to, to serve people right out of homelessness with a variety of things. I won't list them all. But one of the things is, in this last year, we, we set aside a third of our vacancies have gone to people coming directly out of homelessness. And the only reason we couldn't do more is we need to have the services in our properties for those folks to succeed. We're not going to put people in and get them back out on the street. And we've added social workers and programs so that people get in. And as you say, they've got to get in first and then build their lives. And we want to help them build their lives and succeed. But we've built up hundreds of other uh, uh, pieces to this homeless uh, issue. And we are very close in this region to ending chronic homelessness, effective chronic homelessness, because of everybody working together with these kinds of models. And we need more, and we need more support. OK. Yeah, right here. My, I've noticed in a lot of gentrifying neighborhoods that along with the gentrification comes a reduction in the number of local shopkeepers. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about, let's say, making housing affordable, it, it, housing affordable in these neighborhoods that are gentrifying, when you lose the small business owners right, mm -hmm. to this gentrification, mm -hmm. it seems like the economy then suddenly shifts. Because even if you're in low-income housing in these areas, the stores that are left over aren't affordable and the culture sort of goes away. So is there any thought process around like while you're dealing with the housing crisis, what about the small business owner crisis that kind of goes along with it in these changing neighborhoods? Well, I would just say that I don't think it's feasible to have rent control for commercial properties, okay? Um, what does happen more in commercial properties than residential is that when something doesn't rent, the rent will eventually come down. But I would say, if you reduce the incentive to gentrify the area, then the commercial rents will not go up as quickly. Oh. So many empty shop spaces now because they're holding out for future rents and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mayor. Mayor. Right. Mayor. I'm, I'm just going to say one of the most interesting ideas on that is to just tax property owners that leave their properties vacant. I mean, this is something we're yes. trying to achieve in Albany now. It's called right. vacancy tax because it blights a neighborhood. If you, it's yes. not just that we miss the mom and pop store, but someone who owns property is leaving it vacant, is having a yes. negative impact on the rest of us, and it's you know, creating less opportunity for someone new to come along who might create a neighborhood business. So let's use the power we have and tax them to send a message that we won't accept it. That's All right. <laughs> Cities and counties owe tens of thousands of properties. In most cities, they don't even know what they own. You cannot even get an inventory of what they own. Uh, those cities ought to divest of those mm -hmm. properties either to sell them and then use the proceeds to subsidize housing or else to develop the housing on those sites. OK. Uh, I think we've run out of time. Uh, this is an issue that obviously needs a whole lot of discussion all over this country. And I want to thank uh, our three panelists for the great work that they have done. Thank you. Thank you.